soon. So, all right, so uh, yeah, thank you again, everyone, for coming to today's tutoring session. Today, we'll be covering problems at 11 from 5 to 7 p.m. If you refer to the chat, I posted a rough schedule that we'll try to follow. And really, the idea for these tutoring sessions is that we're trying to stretch out the amount of time that we're devoting to each problem. So we highly encourage you to ask your questions. So with that said, uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. So whoever's doing problem one, uh, please start. Hi, uh, my name is Niti. I'm going to go over some of the concepts behind problem number one. So I'm just going to share my notes. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Okay, so some of the concepts that problem number one goes over, um, kind of same concept as last week with like delta G, delta G naught, and then the equilibrium constants. So the first thing I'll start with is the equilibrium constant Q. Um, so it's just the ratio of the concentration of products over the concentration of reactants. And this is when it's not at equilibrium. So it just represents like the current state or the current conditions that you've been given in the problem. And K is, basically the same constant but when it is at equilibrium so it's the same ratio at equilibrium um, and then delta g just your free energy change of a reaction um, so in a problem they might give you like value of like r t q and then just have you find out what the value hey of Nithi, is. could you could you make your screen like full screen or bigger would be easier to see yeah is that or, better and how, how do you get your you know, the stuff where you have your notes. Is this um, one note? It's one note. You should have a little dual arrow somewhere to the right, mm -hmm. which if you click on it, you'll, you'll zoom into this uh, material. Oh, okay. And the upper, you, on my screen, it's usually on the upper, yeah, the upper right hand, all the way to the right hand, there should be a full screen symbol. Or just go to view and try view full screen. Uh, no. Oh, you are in full screen. I don't know. I don't quite know why all your. Uh, anyway, okay. Does that does this help? Yeah, yeah that's better. Yeah. Okay. That's better. Yeah, I'm not sure because I am on full screen on mine. So I'll try to figure that out for next time. Okay, but hopefully this is better. Yes. Okay. Um, and then delta G naught is the value of the free energy change of a reaction under standard conditions. So an, e an equation that we have that relates kind of all of these values um, is just right here that your delta G is equivalent to your delta G naught plus RT ln Q. Um, and so when you have a problem where you're given like certain uh, like concentrations of products and reactants, you can use this equation to figure out any values that you're missing. And as we know that at when the ratio of products and reactants is at equilibrium, we know that our delta G value is zero. So just kind of looking at this graphic, um, they kind of show in a step basis how when you put in delta G is zero, then your Q is basically K, and then how you derive that your, where your delta G naught comes from and that the value of it is just negative RT ln K. And kind of as we talked about last week too, um, so when the value of Q is less than K, which means that you have less, um, which means that you're on your, the value of Q is less than K, so you're um, at less than equilibrium, then the value of your delta G is positive and opposite for the other side. So when your delta G naught is negative, then your, equal, then your um, reaction will, is more favorable because you're releasing energy. And when your delta G naught is positive, then your reaction is unfavorable because it's requiring energy. Are there any questions over some of the concepts that I went over? Okay, then I will let, it, let the next tutor kind of go back to the problem set for number one. I think you're muted. I'll unmute. Can 
you hear me? Yes, now we can. So we are studying the first reaction of glycolysis, which is the ATP and gly um, glucose is converted into ADP and glucose 6 phosphate. And for the question A, we are given that the magnitude is given to be 17.3 kilojoules per mole, and then asking whether the sign would be positive or negative. So we are interested in, in delta G, and then we know that for delta G, we have to consider the two factors. One is the concentration, and two is the chemical characteristics. And then, one of the examples of the char chemical characteristics is electrostatic repulsion. And the other is the hydrophobic effect. So basically the electro electrostatic repulsion is more of like entropy contribution while well, hydro hydrophobic effect is an entropy contribution. And because we are interested in the standard free energy now, that we gonna assume the first condition is that it's gonna be one molar constant pressure and um and temperature at twenty five degrees and so on. So what we need to look at for this question is focus on the chemical characteristics, which means that we have to focus on the structures of those molecules ATP, glucose, ADP, G6P. And to make the simple, um, to understand this question easier, I'm going to break it down into two systems where the ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP and then inorganic phosphate, and the second reaction where the glucose is phosphorylated to G6P. So I already made a drawing for the ATP and the and glucose. And so we gonna look at the each reactions. So for each reactions, we are interested in which direction is more favorable. And when we draw the structures, it's necessary to know which part of the molecules to look at. So where the chemistry takes place. So for ADP, ATP and ADP, I only drew the phosphate group because where that's the where the, the chemistry takes place. So we know that this phosphate, inorganic phosphate group is the leaving group for this reaction. And then we know that phosphate group is a good leaving group because, because of the resonance, how the electrons are delocalized across atoms. And we also see the, the negative charge bearing oxygen in nearby phosphate. And we know that because of the electrostatic repulsion, this is gonna result into the the right direction of the process more favorable than the other. And if you look at the glucose and then glucose and G6P, we know that G6P and the inorganic phosphate is a good leaving group. And also at the same time, the hydrogen is less electronegative compared to the oxygen, such that the electron is, resides more on the um, oxygen, so, such that the structure on the left, the glucose, is pretty stable than G6P. So we know that the leftward direction is going to be more favorable. Now, if you were to look at overall reaction of the first reaction with glycolysis, it's basically we are adding, basically sort of adding the reaction one and reaction two given on the bottom. So this, the first reaction will give a negative delta G and then the second one give us a positive delta G. Now we're interested in which one is actually, which was more negative or which one's more positive relative to one another. And then we have to look at their chemical structures. So on the, on, on the above, so we see the, we see the oxygen having a negative, bearing a negative charge so that we observe electrostatic repulsion for reaction one, driving this, the right word forward. On the other hand, for the G6P, we only see the carbon and, and hydrogens, which are not, which doesn't play a big role in electrostatic repulsion because those are just basically hydrophobic. So we know that the first reaction is, is gonna be more negative than the second reaction. Therefore, the first one is, is more negative relative to the second. Therefore, the resulting, the delta G would be negative. Okay, so part B. So 
we are given the concentrations of those molecules, ATP, inorganic phosphate, ADP, glucose, G6P, and we are asked to calculate the reaction free energy. And now this is no longer a standard condition, so that as I described above, we need to take consider consideration of the concentration. And the way we do that is basically we have, we add the standard condition and RT, L, and Q to take account of the concentration difference than the standard condition. And then from the lectures that we know that Q constant is basically the multiplication of all the concentration of the product over the all multiplications of all the concentration of reactants. So that it's gonna be, for this reactions will be G6P times ADP over ATP over glucose. And then it is important to note that from this question, we are given the concentration of inorganic phosphate, but this is a trick actually, because if you look at the if you look at the reaction above, we have phosphate in the, rea in the reactant and the product side, meaning that it's actually if the phosphate is on the both numerator and denominator such that they get canceled out so that we don't really take consideration of the inorganic phosphate concentration for calculating Q. Also at the same time, we have to take a note that Q is a unit list while the concentrations have units. So we need, so the way we remove the units are doing the calculation and canceling out the units. So that we need to make sure that all the concentrations for G6P, ADP, ATP, glucose are all uniform. And then nicely for this question, we, everything is in all millimole except the phosphate, which we don't care about. So it's nice that we don't have to do the unit conversion, but for the other question, it will be nice to keep in mind to think about the units for the concentrations. So the G6P, 10 millimole times 0 0.5 millimole. So if you do the calculations, units cancels out, and then you get 0 0.05. Now we calculated the Q, we can calculate the delta G. From above, we know that this is negative value, negative value K kilojoules per mole, plus 2.5 kilojoules for RT, and we are given that as 300, uh, 300 Kelvin, so it's 2.5 kilojoules for RT and LN 0.05. So you can do the calculation and get the answer. Part C. So the Part C is actually the, basically like a reverse of Part B because here we are looking at the number of glucose molecules when the reaction were uh, reaction one were to be in an equilibrium, making assumption that other reactants else than glucose are at their original concentration. And then we are also given that the cell is approximately a sphere with a radius 10 micrometer. Be the reason why this is the reverse because we are given the delta G and then we are interested in the number of glucose. That means we have to find, calculate the Q, Q constant. And then from the Q constant, we can calculate the molar, uh, um, molar concentration of the glucose. So first, we are told that this is an equilibrium, which means the delta G has to be zero. And using the equation above, we are also given that this is equal to delta G standard condition plus RT, L, and Q. And we know that this is zero. By rearranging this equation, negative delta G standard equals RT, L, and Q. And we're gonna divide it by RT on both sides. And then we're gonna take the Q out. So it's gonna be E to the negative delta G standard over RT. And we are given the delta G uh, given above in the question. And then we know the RT. And then for the T, we're gonna use the 300 Kelvin. So from here, we can get the answer. And we also given, we also did a calculation in part B where the Q quotient is, is basically G6P, ADP over ATP over glucose. And then here we are making everything constant than the glucose. So we are just, we just don't know the glucose concentration. So we're gonna equate this answer with this expression to calculate the glucose concentration. So we get the answer one. 
And then this is going to be in molar. And then if you were to do the unit analysis, the molar is moles over liter. And then the final answer we want to get is the number of molecules, which means that we have to get rid of the volume, the liter on the bottom by multiplying something by volume, and then converting the mole into Avogadro's number to get the molecules. So we have to calculate the volume of the cells, and then we're going to use the sphere on um, the Rita radius, 10 micro, uh, micrometer condition to calculate the volume. So the volume is basically 4 over 3 pi r cubed, basically the formula for the sphere volume. And then we're going to do 3 over 3 pi 10 to the negative 6 meter oh God, and cube. The reason why I'm converting the micrometer into the meter is because the meter cube is convenient to convert to the liter because we know that 1,000 liter is equivalent to 1 meter squared. Um, one, one meter cubed. So from here, we're going to get the second answer given in liter. So ultimately, if you were to do, if you were, so from the answer one, which is in moles over liter, if you multiply it by answer two, liter, we can get rid of the mole, uh, we can get rid of the liter, and now I, we can convert the mole into Avogadro's number. to finally get the number of glucose molecules per cell. Is there any question? Okay. Wait, so, for, this, uh, for this last question, um, hmm? is Q, yeah. is that supposed to be KEQ instead because it's at equilibrium? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, can we repeat the question again? Yeah, so when you write Q, so the question says that equilibrium, right? So should it be KQ instead? Hey, KQ. KEQ, like the e like equilibrium constant? Oh, okay. The, hmm. huh. I mean, we still wouldn't know what it is. So like, we'd still have to do the same math, right? Yeah, that's true. Or in terms of the notation, is Q like universal or is it like only when it's not at equilibrium? So basically the Q is the constant where you're using it uh, to take consideration that concentrations of the molecules and the reactions are different from the standard condition. Okay. And then we already make a, we already took account of the equilibrium by setting the delta G equals zero. Okay. And in this question, we are just interested in the concentration of glucose at which where we reach the equilibrium. Okay, and then for, can I ask a quick question about part, part, part A? Part A? Yeah, so you were saying that the first reaction has a more negative uh, delta G because the, like, the oxygen on the second phosphate like makes the third phosphate a better leaving group because of electrostatics? Yeah. Okay. Because look, yeah. if you have to look at the GCP, the carbon um, compared to the oxygen here. So basically, so we have this phosphate and we have here the carbon. And then next to the phosphate, we have oxygen groups bearing the negative charge. And then there's also resonance. Um, so, so we have a negative charge here. And then, um, but on the other hand, here we only have hydrogens. And then hydrogen doesn't really bear the charge. So it doesn't really contribute to the um, electrostatic repulsion as it as the oxygen does. Therefore, we would expect um, more, um, we would expect the electrostatic repulsion on the eight, um, the second phosphate of the ATP to make the phosph inorganic phosphate group a better leaving group. 
And it makes sense uh, intuitively where we are using the ATP as an energy source for all the biological processes. Okay, thank you. Um, also, just real quick, um, could you explain why that the reaction pushes to the left for number two? Left, okay. Is it, yeah, is it just a better leaving group? Is that it? Or? So, um, yeah, so the, basically the phosphate group is a good leaving group because one of the reasons why is because um, the phosphate is um, roughly weak base, um, basic and at, at the same time, the negative charge on the um, oxygens could be delocalized over the, over the atoms in inorganic phosphate groups. So basically, it is actually pretty stable under, um, under the solution. So it's actually a good leaving group. At the same time, um, for these ones, um, OH, the, ox um, the hydrogen, it can be deprotonated easily and then while the electrons being uh, localized on oxygen for them more time because oxygen being more negative and then it actually makes the stru structure more st um, stable than having the phosphorylated glucose G6P. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. So we will uh, move looks on like there's a question, question in the chat uh, who's asking about the volume of the cell. So how are we able to do the calculation when 10 to the power of 6 to the power of 3 becomes a super small number for the volume? So is that more of a question about actual calculation or is it more like intuitive sense? Like, uh, is it more like the... Sorry, it... I'm a little bit confused because you said that you converted in volume to meters so that it matched in the units. Right. Did you, I was just confused about where you converted. Oh, wait, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, um, okay, uh, so that part, okay, so I made a mathematical mistake here, so which should be 10 here, it's my bad, but, um, so basically the reason why we are converting the micrometer to meter is because um, you can actually do the, you can use a micrometer um, cubed and then convert that into the liter for later. But, but since we know that thousand liter is equivalent to one meter, um, one meter cubed, it makes it much more convenient to convert everything into the meter and later just do the unit conversion between the meter cubed to liter. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. So, we'll move on. All right. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So, hey, everyone. I'm going to be talking about equilibrium constants, and I'll be also going over question two. I think James and Nithi did a pretty good job about talking about the main equations and main concepts related to those ideas, but I'll go, uh, go into a little more depth. So let's talk about K first, our equilibrium constant, which as before we defined as concentration of products over reactants, concentration of reactants. And normally when you're doing a problem, oh, let me reposition this, you can usually just plug into these equations, but how we actually define this is if we had, ooh, I should have done this differently. If we, let's say we had a reaction A plus B going to C, and the lowercase letters are just the stoichiometric coefficients, we would actually define K for this reaction as concentration of A at equilibrium raised to, ah, oh, crap, I did this wrong. <laughs> Sorry, concentration of C, equilibrium products, equilibrium raised to its uh, power divided by the standard state concentration, denoted zero. And same thing for our reactants, A divided by standard state, B divided by standard state. So this is important big for, because this actually means that our equilibrium coefficients and all equilibrium coefficients should be unitless because they should, all these molarities that you're plugging in for at equilibrium, they should all cancel out with each other. So you should get a unitless answer technically, 
Uh, now, when you're talking about dissociation, constants, and other stuff, biochemists like to report those with units, but technically, your equilibrium constants should be unitless. So that's important to note. And what this also allows us to do is explain why H2O drops out of our equilibrium out of this equation. So can someone just either in chat or just unmute yourself, tell me what's, does it, what's the concentration of water at standard state? If anyone knows. You know, that's fine. I'll, uh, it's 55 molar, which is huge, really, really big, right? When we're dealing with problems where we're talking about concentrations on, you know, micromolar or one or two molar, 55 molar is really, really concentrated. So if we're looking at in our equation, taking whatever uh, equilibrium, let's say, concentration of water divided by concentration at standard state, it's sort of like, and this is just the way I like to think about it. It's not necessarily mathematically accurate, but it's sort of like we had 55 molar in the bottom and then our equilibrium we would have like 54.99 molar, which is essentially equal to one. So that's basically just explaining why H2O will drop out of your equilibrium uh, equation because the change from standard state is so tiny, it's basically equal to one and doesn't affect your constant. All right, and then we can also talk about Q and K as before. If Q is defined the same way, just products of reactants, except concentration of products and reactants at some place other than equilibrium, right? And it's the same thing. This is also divided by standard state. So we all know from before that, let's say if we have our Q value is less than K, that that means there's way more reactants than products, right? So it's gonna favor the forward reaction. So we know it's gonna to wanna to make more products to reach equilibrium. And the reverse is also true. If, there's, if Q is greater than K, there's way more products. Reverse reaction is favored and it's going to want to make more of those reactions, reactants. We can actually examine this using our delta G equation, which I'll remind you is delta G is equal to delta G naught, standard state free energy change, plus R, T, L, and Q. If we substitute in for delta G naught, which as a reminder is negative R, T, L, and K, so that's dependent on our equilibrium constant, K, we'll get negative R, T, L and K plus RT, L and Q. Factor that and you should get, using your log rules, LN of Q divided by K. And that's equal to delta G. So now let's look at the case where Q is greater than K. If Q is greater than K, this quantity, LN Q over K, is going to be greater than zero, right? It's going to be positive. Which means our delta G value overall will be greater than zero, which means it's spontaneous in the reverse direction, correct? If it's positive, it's gonna favor the reverse direction. So spontaneous, spontaneous, and reverse. Same thing for Q is less than K, LN Q over K is gonna be less than zero. It's gonna be negative. Our delta G is now negative, and now it's spontaneous in the forward direction. So this is just another way of thinking about spontaneity, but relating them, sorry, I realized the camera's off, relating them to our equilibrium coefficients. Does that make sense to everyone? Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay then, in that case, I'll just move on to going over question two, which is pretty straightforward. One second, let me just get positioned here. Oops. All right, so question number two. Oops, you can't see that. All right, so we're given the reaction A plus 3B uh, is equal to 2C. And they gave us the equilibrium constants equal to 
10,000. 10,000. And they gave us the reaction started at certain concentrations. A is 0 0.01 molar. Concentration of B is 0.2 millimolar. And C is 0.7 molar. These are all concentrations. So part A is simply asking us what is the value of the reaction coefficient? And remember, that's simply going to be your products, right? Raised to their appropriate coefficient divided by the standard state, uh, standard state values, which usually standard state values are all going to be one, right? So those will drop out. And it's basically just concentration of products divided by concentration of reactants. I won't go through the math too much, but remember this should be unitless, correct? So make sure you're converting, you're uh, converting your units for these concentrations because some are in molar, some are in millimolar, millimolar. So make sure you convert properly and ensure that you get a unitless answer and make sure you're paying attention to stoichiometry as well because those are going to become your exponents in your equation. And I hope everyone can see that. Yes. Okay. And then for part B, will the reaction proceed spontaneously to the spontaneously, oh God, to the left or right? So depending on your value of Q, again, you can compare that, whatever you get from part A, compare that to the 10,000, that's the equilibrium constant given. And again, if it's greater than, you're gonna see the reverse reaction favored. Excuse me, reverse reaction favored. And if it's less than, it's the forward reaction. Simple as that, just make sure you explain it clearly. You can talk about the delta G values as well if you want. Does that make sense to everyone? Are there any questions about problem two? Sorry. Uh... I'm kind yeah. of confused about um, where like the standard values are. Yeah, let me go back to this. So standards, the standard state values. So we're just defining our equilibrium constant equation as taking the concentration at equilibrium and dividing it by concentration at standard state. Now, and that's, some, that's how we define that constant, and that's why it should be unitless. Standard state for all, uh, all compounds is usually one molar. So I'll just say like C at standard state should be one molar. If it's H2O, however, it's gonna be 55 molar. And there's some other parameters as well, like one atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. Does, does that make sense though? That's just our definition for it, and we're gonna end up getting a unitless constant for that. So for this problem, they should all just be like one. Yeah, they should all be one. Okay, Usually, okay. Okay, yeah. Cool. Sorry if that confused you. Usually you don't have to think about it, but I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that. Okay. Any other questions? Um, mm -hmm. For the, since one of them is in millimolar, we have to convert it to molar, right? Yes. Okay, so they ought to be the same. Yeah, Thank so you, you should get these all to cancel. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you. And then do the, um, the sorry, in the equations like A plus 3B, then does that three become an exponent for yes. uh, reactants? Right, so your three will become an exponent, your two will become an exponent, and okay. there's technically one here that's also an exponent, but we don't need to write that. Yes, so thank you. exponents, of course. Anything else? Can you flip to the front, at the bottom of the front? I just want to check something real quick. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, sorry. Let me see if I can zoom out. So see okay, that. cool, cool. I'm, I mean, I'm good now. I, I just, just checking my signs. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. If anyone doesn't have questions, then I think we can move on to the third problem. Um, okay. So let me just get my screen ready. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so I'm going to review the thermodynamics of a ligand binding to a protein. Now, we are going to apply these concepts to protein ligand binding. However, um, you can use the same intuition for protein-protein binding or the binding of two molecules to each other um, by weak interactions. So this diagram shows you the binding of a protein to its ligand and it forms a protein ligand complex. Now since this process can proceed in either direction, um, association or dissociation, it's reversible and it can therefore be thought of as an equilibrium process. Because it's an equilibrium process, um, the protein ligand binding has an equilibrium constant and this is known as the association constant or Ka. Um, so Ka can be written as the concentration of products of a reactants or the concentration of the protein ligand complex over the concentration of protein times that of ligand. Um, so by convention, what we typically do is we represent this equilibrium in terms of the opposite reaction or dissociation of the protein ligand complex. And for this, we use um, the dissociation constant or KD, which is basically the equilibrium constant for the protein unbinding from the ligand. So KD is basically the reciprocal of Ka, and that is concentration of protein times concentration of ligand over the concentration of the protein ligand complex. Um, this is equal to one over Ka. Now, because it's an equilibrium constant, um, Kd is technically unitless. So, um, so Kd is unitless, but however, we typically convey Kd with the units of molar. So why is this? So recall that each concentration in Kd is actually the concentration relative to the standard state concentration. So Kd, the equilibrium constant, is actually um, each of these terms, each of these terms can be divided, sorry, divided by the standard state concentration. Um, and then remember that each of these standard state concentrations are just one. Um, and this is what allows this constant to be unitless. However, um, if we factor out the standard state term, so if we factor out the standard state term, we can rewrite this as, um, This term times a pseudo KD and um, this KD is a measure of KD that has units of molar and um, it has the same value as this KD because this cancels out to one. And this is what we typically refer to as KD. Um, and therefore, since we can write KD in terms of molar, we, we can compare it to other relevant concentrations such as the concentration of ligand, which we'll go over later. All right. So why is KD relevant and what can the value of KD tell us? So KD is related to the standard free energy change of binding, 
or delta G naught of binding by the following equation. So the standard free energy change of binding is negative RT ln of Ka, which is um, the equilibrium constant for the forward reaction. Um, but remember that Ka is just one over Kd. So this is equal to negative RT ln of one over Kd, which you can simplify to positive RT ln of Kd. So the standard free energy change of binding in terms of Kd can just be written as positive RT ln of Kd. Okay, so because the free energy change of binding varies depending on the affinity of the interaction or how strongly the protein and ligand bind to each other, the KD is also used as a measure of affinity of the ligand for the protein. So when KD is low, um, or when KD is much less than one, this means that, um, let me rewrite the KD equation here real quick. Looks like Okay, so when KD is low, this means that there is more protein ligand complex present relative to free protein and free ligand, um, which indicates a strong um, high affinity interaction, which has a low um, delta G naught of binding. So when KD is low, this indicates that the interaction has a high affinity. And typical values of low KDs or of high affinity interactions include, um, or they're on the order of like nanomolars to picomolars, which is basically 10 to the 9 to 10 to, or 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 12 molar. And then, um, if KD is high, this would mean that there is more free protein and free ligand relative to protein ligand complex at equilibrium. And this indicates that the reaction or the interaction has a low affinity instead. And consequently, a high delta G of binding. So, In order to study the favorability of the binding of a particular interaction, we can measure and plot what is known as a binding isotherm. So um, typically the way that this is carried out is that you mix together a protein and ligand and they fluoresce when they bind to each other. And the amount of fluorescence present at equilibrium can give us an idea of the concentration of ligand and protein complex, again, at equilibrium. So um, then we can vary the different concentrations of ligand and keep the protein concentration the same. And then we can see how the amount of protein ligand complex varies, again, at equilibrium. So the shape of a simple binding isotherm, meaning a non-allosteric binding isotherm, is typically hyperbolic, as you can see in this diagram. This is from the textbook. Um, so at low ligand concentrations, there's enough protein present in solution that most of the protein, um, or that the amount of protein ligand complex will rise dramatically. But eventually, when you add enough ligand, the protein available is going to saturate with ligand. So the amount of protein ligand complex won't increase further and it'll reach a sort of plateau. Uh, so that's why the shape of the binding isotherm is hyperbolic. 
Now, a binding isotherm can give us useful information about the KD of a reaction. And this is because when the ligand concentration equals the KD of a reaction, the, the protein would be half saturated. So the fraction bound would be one half. And um, Pujan will go over the derivation of the fraction bound later and you'll see exactly why this is. But um, basically for now you can see that if you know the ligand concentration at which half of the protein is bound, um, and you can see that this is the ligand concentration in, on this curve at which half of the protein is bound, then you can determine the KD and this can tell you how strong this interaction is. So this is the information that you can get from a binding isotherm. Okay, so that's all I have. Does anyone have questions before we can move on? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, um, he goes on in class about nanometers to pi micrometers that being, I don't know, really good as a drug because, um, you know, things bind to each other a lot more easily. Um, are we referring to the concentration of the protein ligand complex with those numbers and those units? Um, so it's true that a an interaction with a KD on the order of nanomolar to picomolar would be a good drug binding interaction because you want the drugs to bind very tightly. Um, this would typically refer to, again, the concentration of ligand, or yeah, the concentration of ligand at which half of the protein is bound and not necessarily the concentration of the protein ligand complex itself. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Okay, yes. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Okay, so we can then move on to solving problem three, which Elena will cover. Cool, let me set up my screen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. And can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So for um, part A of question three, we see a diagram of a binding isotherm, which is a set of measurements at a constant temperature for a drug binding to a protein at 300 Kelvin. And the binding of the drug changes the fluorescence of tryptophan residues in the protein, which are graphed as a function of the concentration of the drug. And in part one, we're told that when the drug is added at very high concentrations, the fluorescence reaches a plateau of 300 units. And we are asked to explain why the fluorescence does not increase. So some things to think about. Um, can someone tell me what the fluorescence signal corresponds to here? Protein drug complex? Right, so um, the higher the fluorescence signal, the more protein drug binding events there are. So then, right, so as the signal increases, there um, are more binding events. And what might be limiting then in this case, as the fluorescence starts to plateau. The amount of protein, right? Right. So this means that the protein molecules are being saturated with the drug, which means there are no more binding sites available for the drug to bind, which means, which explains why the fluorescence won't increase. Are there any questions about this? Okay, um, and then for part two, uh, we're asked to calculate the dissociation constant based on this binding isotherm. Um, so we have this equation that the fraction bound equals the concentration of ligand divided by the KD plus the concentration of ligand. Um, has everyone seen this before? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is nice because the fluorescence gives us a way to figure out the fraction bound and we have the concentration of ligand, which is the concentration of drug, which is the x axis of this chart. So we have a way to find the KD and to make things even nicer, as um, Shivani explained, 
when the concentration of ligand equals the KD, then the bound fraction becomes one half. So from the previous question, we know that at 300 fluorescence, the bound fraction is one because essentially 100% of the protein is bound. So can someone tell me what fluorescence corresponds to a bound fraction of one half? If we think about um, the fluorescence reflecting how much protein is being bound, if we have at 300, all of it is bound, how much, uh, what signal do we expect where one half of the protein is bound? 150. Right. And then going from that, um, as Shivani again explained, you can trace that back to the concentration of drug, which gives you the uh, Katie. Are there any questions about this? So um, you use the information from part I to solve it rather than the, the graph? Rather than what? The graph. So this was just a convenient way to think about it because in the previous question we um, we related the bound fraction to the fluorescence. So this is just tying that back into looking at the same graph, thinking about what a different bound fraction would be, um, what fluorescence a different bound fraction would have. So we, we still are using the graph. You could have used any bound fraction and any fluorescence value, but it's just simple for us to use one half as the fraction bound because um, we know in those conditions, the KD is equal to the concentration of drug, which is something we can easily trace. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, okay. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, at F bound is equal to half, like at that halfway point, is it, does it mean that half of the protein is bound to the ligand and then the other half of the proteins aren't, right? Just as a reminder? Yes. Okay. And it's not necessarily like a static thing, like because it's an equilibrium, there could be some unbinding events and some more binding events going on. But um, in bulk, like with the population of protein and drug molecules that you have, 50% of your protein will be bound at that right, concentration. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions? Yeah. It wasn't so much that I had a question. It's just like when I did it with the graph, I got like 18. But if you use the number 300, then you get um, like 30. I understand both ways, though. That makes it's, sense. It makes sense when it's stated that the top of the curve is 300. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, it looks like it might be like max at 100 uh, nanomolar, but yeah, it keeps going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So in part three, we're asked to calculate the standard free energy of binding. And this is something that we already went over today. I'm just gonna quickly reiterate. So we have this expression that uh, the free energy equals negative RT L and K, but um, this K actually corresponds to the association constant and not the dissociation constant because we're asked to calculate the free energy of binding, which would be this expression going forward, um, which would be the KA. And we know that the KD is the uh, reciprocal of this. So if we plug in KD as the inverse or reciprocal of K, we get that the delta G of binding equals positive RT L and KD. And we calculated the KD in the previous section of this question. So um, you can plug in those values, but remember to convert your units from nanomolar into molar because um, you're normalizing by the standard conditions, the standard concentration, which is in units of molar. Are there any questions here? Okay, so we can go on to number part four. Um, suppose that the data in the graph do not represent a binding isotherm, i.e. some of the data were measured at a different temperature. Would it be possible to deduce the value of the dissociation constant and free energy of binding in a meaningful way? So 
basically this question is asking us, is KD dependent on temperature and is the free energy of binding dependent on temperature? Um, and keep in mind that we have this expression, free energy of binding equals RT, L, and KD. So does anyone have any thoughts <laughs> on what the answer might be? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? So for the free energy of binding, we can see because there's a temperature term in that expression, um, that means the free energy of binding is dependent on temperature. For the KD, I'm not sure if you guys have gone over the Van Top equation, but uh, one way to think about it, if you have, um, you can think about Le Chatelier's principle. So if you have, um, let's say an endothermic reaction that you add heat to, that would shift the equilibrium to the right. So that's kind of like maybe an intuitive way to think about the equilibrium constant being dependent on temperature. So both of these terms are temperature dependent, which means that the, a binding isotherm, uh, a graph that does not represent a binding isotherm would not let you meet, like easily determine um, the free energy of binding or the dissociation constant. Are there any questions about this? Um, yeah, just to like kind of clarify, I guess, um, for the first question, KD being dependent on temperature, are you basing it off of the fact that, I guess, just adding heat to any reaction would just decrease the activation energy, so it increase K if it pushes to the right more? Or I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think so. If one of the tutors can confirm. Um, well, I would imagine that uh, whenever you have like a binding event, there's there's an entropy term associated with that, right? Because if you have like a free drug, it has like many possible configurations, uh, but when it binds a protein, it's a lot more limited. So there's like an entropy term, like factoring to that calculation. So there should be some dependency based on temperature then. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pujan. Any other questions? Can okay. you repeat, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry. Um, can you repeat how we're able to find KD based on the information that's given to us? Yeah, so I'll go back to part two of the question. Yeah, if that's all right. Um, so here we're asked to calculate the KD and we're just using the same value. Um, do you want me to go through how we find that? Um, I would say yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So uh, are you familiar with the fraction bound equation on the top here? I'm having a little trouble understanding what fraction bound is. OK. Uh, I don't have a slide where I have the derivation of it. Um, Pujan, just, are you yeah. going to go through it? Yeah, I was just about to do the derivation of fraction bound. OK, so maybe hold a bit until um, Pujan does the derivation, but basically it's how, what percent of your protein concentration, like pool of protein that you're looking at is bound to your molecule of interest. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, hopefully um, it should make more sense when you see how we get this expression, but um, we can do some like manipulations to have a way to um, derive the KD from this graph. Yeah, hopefully it'll make more sense. Um, any other questions on any part we've done so far? Oops, sorry. In that case, we can go over 3B. So we have that your startup company has isolated a programmable DNA endonuclease that you believe may be the next big thing in genetic engineering. And you know that the dissociation constant of this endonuclease is 0.1 nanomolar. And we're asked to calculate the fraction of enzyme bound to target DNA if the concentration of DNA is 5 nanomolar. So um, again, we see that the KD of the enzyme is 0.1 nanomolar. And then I just rewrote it into molar. And the concentration, so does anyone have an idea of how we can Calculate the fraction bound.
we can use the same expression that we used previously. Um, something to note here, so in this case, the DNA duplex is the ligand, which maybe is a little weird, but um, you can think of it as the bound fraction and the KD refers to your protein of interest. And then the ligand is whatever this protein is binding to or whatever is binding to this protein. So in this case, we have an enzyme that's binding to target DNA. Um, so in that case, the DNA is our ligand. So we can plug in those values into our fraction bound equation. Um, it's a good practice to convert units into molar, but in this case, since both of these measures are in nanomolar, you technically don't have to convert units um, because they'll cancel out. Are there questions here? Mm, so in regards to like fraction bound and um, working with equations for K, like when are other cho um, options where we have to worry about units? Because most of the time units just cancel out because it's just fractions or probability, right? If you're given um, like a bound fraction, sorry, if you're given a dissociation constant in nanomolar or but a concentration in like micromolar, if those concentrations don't agree. All right, cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. In that case, we can keep going. Okay, so uh, for the conceptual review for question four, I'm going to go over fraction bound, scattered analysis, and then talk about Alice area, which is all going to be applied in question four. So I'll just get right to it. Um, it seems like um, a lot of us are asking questions about what exactly fraction bound is. Well, just to kind of give you a definition before we get started, it's the portion of like a protein or an enzyme that is actually bound to a ligand or a small molecule. And so uh, here I've just written a few equations that can help us with this. Uh, so right now, like fraction bound is equal to essentially like the amount of protein that's bound to ligand, right? P dot L divided by the total amount of protein. However, this is not the form of fraction bound that you typically deal with when you're solving a lot of problems. So I'll be stepping through the derivation to get through the more familiar form. Um, some other equations to keep track of that will help us with this derivation are, uh, of course, the equilibrium that's defined um, when you ever, whenever you have a protein binding to a ligand, which is essentially just uh, this right here, and the expression for KD, which is going to be very useful. So right off the bat, what we want to do is we want to be able to express this in terms of just the ligand and KD, because that's a form that we've seen. So uh, we can make a few uh, useful simplifications. So first of all, we can express KD in terms of PL. So and this is just by rearranging the numerator and the denominator, you get that value for PL. And so you can substitute it into fraction bound and you will get this. And then recall that because p total is given by this, we can make that substitution as well. And so at this point, uh, we can also notice that uh, all, every single equation here has a p, l, and a kd in common. So we can divide by those terms. Of course, uh, this term over here doesn't have those in common, so there are going to be some residual terms. So if we divide by p, and also multiply by KD on the numerator and the denominator, we're going to end up with And that's really where the derivation for fraction bound comes from is this expression right here. Um, so also note here that because this gives you the amount of protein that is bound to ligand whenever KD is equal to L, that means that half of your protein is bound to ligand. And the reason why we care about fraction bound is if you have um, a drug that uh, treats a particular type of cancer and you want to know what amount of drug you need to be able to give in order to have a therapeutic effect, then you know you could go through your research and determine that, okay, if 75% uh, of your target needs to be bound to your drug, then the drug will be effective. So. Uh, an example of this, which you might have discussed in class, would be imatinib, which is an inhibitor for ABL kinase, and that's uh, implicated in a variety of cancers. So it'd be helpful to know what the KD value of imatinib binding to uh, ABL kinase is so that you can determine what should be the blood concentration of imatinib in order to like, have a meaningful difference in someone who's, who's a patient. And so from this, 
uh, we can pretty much just plot the relationship between uh, the fraction of protein bound and the ligand. So as you've kind of seen in previous problems before, uh, this is a hyperbolic relationship that kind of saturates at a certain point. And what you should keep in mind is that the limit of this is one, because of course you can't have more than 100% of your protein bound. And another important point right here is fraction bound of one half, which corresponds to your KD. So that's a pretty useful reference point just when you're doing calculations and working with problems. However, um, notice that because the shape of this curve is kind of hyperbolic, that's not very convenient when you're doing more types of analysis. So ideally, we would like a curve that's linear with respect to the ligand concentration of some kind. So we can, provide, we can perform some additional transformations to make it linear. So in order to do that, uh, just observe that f over 1 minus f here. I'll kind of separate it. So observe that f over 1 minus f is equal to concentration of ligand divided by KD. And this is because we already know F is L uh, over L plus KD. And 1 minus F is, of course, KD over L plus KD. And so now we have this expression. And so if we take the log of this, we can get an expression that's linear with respect to L. Because if you recall, if you have the log of X divided by Y, then by log properties, you get log of X minus log of Y. So similarly, if we were to take the log of f over 1 minus f, then we would get log of ligand concentration minus log of KD. And so now we have a relationship that's linear with respect to L, specifically with respect to log of L. And here we have log of f over 1 minus f. And so we can draw this line. in this manner. Here we have one important point because we know that our expression is log of L minus log of KD. Uh, whenever you have a fraction bound of exactly one half, you're going to get, well, because if F is one half, then one minus F is one half, you're gonna get the log of one, which is zero. So whenever this value is zero, so at F equals one half, you have log of F over one minus F equals zero, that's when your log of ligand concentration is equal to the log of KD. So uh, that could be useful when you're solving problems. Uh, does anyone have any questions on sort of the math that was done here? Yeah, so what does um, F over one minus F exactly stand for? Um, it, it not, it's not exactly a particularly meaningful quantity other than it's just something that helps us analytically solve problems. So. Um, for example, if you have a protein in which like 30% of it is bound, F is 0.3, 1 minus F is just 1 minus 0.3. So it would just be 0 0.3 over 0 0.7. Um, just the main benefit is that it allows us to have like a linear plot so that whenever we're trying to get real world data and we just have like plots along this line, we can perform linear regression and get values like KD, um, like <coughs> empirically. Hey, Poojan? Yes. If I could just uh, interrupt for a minute, F over 1 minus F is fraction bound over fraction unbound. So it is actually conceptually very important if you have a cancer target you wanna hit, F over my, one minus F tells you how much you've hit versus how much you haven't hit. Okay. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, then the next thing I'll move on to is scattered analysis. So first, what exactly is scattered analysis and in what cases would it be relevant? So the one use case where this can be pretty important is that say you have a population of cells, which I've attempted to draw right here. Uh, and then if you were to lyse the, cell, lyse the cells and extract the lysate, um, and let's say you're interested in um, one particular receptor, um, then it's not always easy to quantify a priori what the concentration of that receptor is. And uh, a lot of scattered analysis was developed like kind of back in like the 1970s before, like you had a lot more advanced methods of like quantifying the specific concentrations of certain proteins. So scattered analysis was a, was a method that's developed in order to extract both the concentration of total protein and also the binding affinity of a particular protein with a particular drug. And it's, it's a powerful form of analysis because you can essentially extract these forms of information just by performing several experiments and then eventually doing linear regression and getting back those values. 
So in order to do scattered analysis, there are a few key assumptions uh, that need to be made. So the first assumption is that the concentration of ligand that you have bound to a protein target is going to be much, much, much less than the amount of ligand that you have free. So we should ask, why can we make this assumption? And the main reason why we make this assumption is because we're the ones who control the amount of free ligand or the amount of total ligand in a given experiment. So even if you have a very high concentration of protein within your cell lysate, like let's say your uh, total concentration is something like one millimolar, then you can control your free ligand concentration to be 100 millimolar such that the amount of ligand that's bound is just 1% of the free concentration. Uh, so that allows us to make this simplification over here, where if we know what the total ligand concentration is, and we know that it's essentially just the free ligand concentration plus the bound ligand concentration, that approximates to just the concentration of ligand that we started out in the beginning of the experiment. The second assumption that we'll be making when we're doing scattered analysis is that the drug or the ligand that we're adding into our cell lysate is only going to bind to our protein of interest. So there are a few ways to control for this experimentally if you're able to at least do some amount of uh, filtering out to make sure you only have a certain amount of protein, uh, or if you are sure based on this thorough literature search that your drug only binds one thing, then this is a safe assumption to make. But for the context of uh, the problem set, this is definitely a safe assumption to make. So here I've just rewritten a few equations that are going to be useful, which is that the total amount of protein that you have, that, which is um, the amount of free protein that you have is equal to the total protein minus the amount of protein that's bound. And this, once again, here is our expression for KD. And our goal with scattered analysis is to be able to get this in terms of ligand bound over uh, free ligand concentration. And then here on the x-axis, we'll have ligand bound. And the reason why this is important is because when we're performing measurements uh, practically in uh, scattered analysis, this is going to be useful. And I'll talk about that as a sort of step through the derivation here. So first, we can rewrite this with our value of p so that we have p total minus p dot l times l and as we've uh, discussed previously um, we can rewrite p dot l uh, in terms of uh, kd so that uh, gives us This should be, should be L bound actually. Yeah, so actually there, uh, I skipped a few steps, um, but this simplifies to And this is the, this is the expression that we have uh, for KD. And to extract essentially L bound over L, we can rearrange some more terms so that we get KD is equal to And then if we further rearrange this, oh, I guess I've drifted a little bit. So if we further rearrange this, We get this expression and then we can just take the reciprocal here to get your ligand bound concentration or total ligand is equal to total protein divided by KD minus ligand bound over KD. And so here uh, there are actually, yeah, I hope you can all read that. Uh, so here, We've written an expression that's linear with respect to ligand bound. And experimentally, the way that we determine ligand bound is that when you're doing an experiment involving scattered analysis, typically you have a mixture of protein, uh, but you also have the addition of a certain population of ligands in which some percentage of them are radioactive or have some type of property which you can quantify. So the way that this is done is that you would take your lysate containing your protein, you would add your ligand to it, uh, you would mix them together and then you would extract just your protein, you would discard the free ligand that doesn't bind, and then you would do some type of, usually it's scintillation analysis if you have a radioactive ligand, and then you're able to calculate, okay, um, like some type of, the, the, the machine will give you a readout saying that in this sample you have a certain amount of 
ligand. Um, so you have a certain amount. So this is your this is your concentration of ligands. So you that will give you one point here. And because you know what L is, you can scale it accordingly. And so if you perform multiple experiments like that, then you can get a curve like this, which you can use linear regression, and then you can approximate this as a line because we know that this equation applies. So the relationship has to be linear. And there are a few key things that we can kind of glean from this. So first of all, the slope is equal to negative one over KD because of this term in the expression right here. Let's hold that so the camera focuses. And is, is, is one negative one over KD because of this term over here. Uh, furthermore, we know that in terms of uh, computing the intercepts, we can get uh, the amount of free protein. So if you were able to uh, extrapolate this further, which physically um, that doesn't really have much of a meaning other than you have no ligand bound, but you'd be able to compute the y-intercept um, and then that would essentially, actually the, uh, the x-intercept, sorry. So whenever, when you get this value, that will give you your value for total protein. So those are two meaningful things that you can get from a graph of scatter analysis. Uh, so that was, that was quite a bit of math. Um, does, does anyone have any questions so far? Yeah, um, your equation for a line, is that, um, what's in the numerator on that last KD term? Here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's ligand bound. Oh, okay, I just couldn't read it. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, my phone isn't really focusing well, but just to reiterate, this is ligand bound divided by L is equal to uh, total protein divided by KD minus ligand bound uh, over KD. All right, uh, then I'll go ahead and move on to the final topic that I want to cover before we get to the problem, which is that of allosteric. Yeah, let me just try to refocus here. Okay. So with allosteric, uh, with al with allosteric uh, sort of a working loose definition that we can apply here is that allosteric is a situation whenever you have the activity of a protein modulated by interactions outside of the active site. So you can kind of imagine this as a situation in which you have potentially a multimeric protein that's either a dimer or a trimer. And the affinity of one binding site with a particular ligand is affected by whether the other binding sites are either bound or unbound. So in this sense, you can think of this as binding sites kind of communicating with each other. So we've already covered the case in which we have no allosteric, And that's just the classic hyperbolic binding isotherm that you've seen already. It looks kind of like this. However, um, there are two key forms of allosteric that uh, you should know for this class, which is positive cooperativity and negative cooperativity. And in the case of positive cooperativity, uh, the story there is that whenever you have some amount of ligand binding to a protein, that increases the affinity of the protein for other ligands later on. And typically, you see a switch-like behavior such as this that's associated with positive cooperativity. And then for negative cooperativity, uh, this is essentially the opposite, in which once you have ligand binding to one of the active sites on a protein, that decreases the affinity of the other binding sites for that particular ligand. So you get an even flatter relationship than what would be seen on a binding isotherm. So to kind of merge these all together and show you what they look like, this is your non allosteric This is what positive cooperativity would look like. And negative cooperativity will look something like this. And another key thing about positive cooperativity is the fact that it has this switch-like behavior, which is really important. So I'm going to mark two points right here. And we'll say that this is approximately 10% bound, and this is 90% bound. And what is really significant is that you have an almost binary switch-like behavior, which would almost be like a transistor flipping from zero to one within a very small ligand concentration range. Whereas if you look at the curve where you have no allosteric whatsoever, going from a fraction bound of 0 0.9 to a fraction bound of 0 0.1 would require you to traverse a much larger ligand range. And so positive cooperativity and allosteric in general was really important in the context of um, some proteins such as hemoglobin, which is really key for oxygen transport. Because you want to have a protein with hemoglobin, you want something that ideally 
whenever the hemoglobin molecule enters the lungs, you want it to quickly um, like bind as much oxygen as possible. But then when it gets to tissues where there's a slightly lower concentration of oxygen, you want that oxygen to be offloaded as fast as possible. Here, you can kind of analyze uh, the idea of allosteri with a more formal discussion of KDs. So here I just have a dimeric protein and a lot of binding events. So first, let's consider what's happening in, in the first row. So here, you have a protein in which one of the binding sites is already occupied. It doesn't matter whether it's the left or the right, um, it can be either, but for the sake of argument, let's just say that it's uh, the one on the right. And so whenever you have the first ligand leaving, you have, we'll call this KD1. And this doesn't mean that it has to be the one on the right, particularly as KD1, it can just be any of the two sites. And when that molecule leaves, you have pretty much your protein completely unbound. However, when you have one molecule, one of your ligand molecules already bound, and you have another molecule, another ligand binding to it, then this has a different KD associated with it. We'll call this KD2. And this would be the case if you have an allosteric relationship, because remember, we're saying that the key idea behind allosteric is that if your one of your binding sites is already occupied, then that changes the affinity of the second binding site for another molecule. And similarly, uh, this is just a redrawing of it. Yeah, KD1 and KD2. So let's try to think about what would be the case, what would be the relationship between KD1 and KD2 if you have positive cooperativity. So just to recall, in this case of positive cooperativity, the affinity for the protein to the second ligand increases after one is already bound. And as a recap, you know that delta G bind uh, is, is a measure of affinity. It's also given by is also given by this. So whenever you have KD2 uh, smaller, whenever you have a KD2 smaller than KD1, that indicates that you have positive cooperativity because that means that after the first ligand molecule is already bound, it's much harder to dissociate that second ligand molecule because it's a higher affinity interaction. So with that, I'll go to the final discussion on allosteric that I wanted to point out. So as we just discussed, in cases of positive cooperativity, you have KD2 can be greater than KD1. However, with negative cooperativity, uh, you have your KD1, actually, sorry. Uh, in the cases of positive cooperativity, your KD2 is smaller. And in cases of negative cooperativity, your KD1 uh, is smaller than your KD2. And if we're, able to, if we're to more formalize this into the discussion of T and R states, um, T and R stands for tense and relaxed. And the reason why these states are called tense and relaxed is that the tense state has a lower affinity, while the relaxed state has a higher affinity. So this is a very general model, uh, ge very general model that applies to um, the discussions of allosteric proteins. And for every single protein, there's going to be a different molecular mechanism associated with it. So if you want to read more about the particular mechanism that leads to TNR states in hemoglobin, I would recommend you go to chapter 14 in your book. It's specifically section 14.16 to 14.17 uh, that talks about the exact uh, what happens really molecularly to give you tense and relaxed states. But with this in mind, we can consider uh, two different graphs. So with an allosteric protein, since there are tense and relaxed states, that means that in the beginning, you are probably going to have a molecule that if it's positive cooperativity, if this protein has positive cooperativity, all of the subunits are going to be in the tense state because you know that after binding occurs, there's going to be greater affinity later. So we know that the relaxed state will happen later. So first, let's consider two different binding isotherms. So this would be the case if your protein were all tense um, all the way to the end. And this would be the case, the red line is the case, if you have a completely relaxed state all the way until the end. And note that uh, fraction bound is one half, that's the KD. So this is gonna be KD2, if this is positive cooperativity, and this would be KD1. So I've annotated them on that graph. And so once again, uh, just so that everyone's familiar with this, the axes here are log L and log of F of one over F. 
And what happens uh, in the case of Alistair is that at some point you have a switch-like behavior in which you transition from having all of your protein be in the tense state to the relaxed state. So a typical binding isotherm for an allosteric protein will look something like this. So if you ignore the dotted lines, what's really happening is this type of behavior. And this region in the middle where the transition is occurring, um, that is also significant for a number of reasons. So this point right here, when you're fraction, uh, fraction bound over fraction unbound, when that is exactly, when the log of that is exactly zero, that gives you a really meaningful relationship in terms of determining the degree of the cooperativity. And this is where the Hill coefficient comes in. So uh, I'm going to skip the derivation for, uh, for the sake of brevity, but it's in box 14.1 in your book. And the derivation is not super important, but what is important is that the Hill coefficient is given by this equation right here, which is that NH is equal to two divided by the root of KD2 over KD1 plus one. And this is the case if you have a two subunit protein. And this is determined by looking at the slope of this binding isotherm whenever you're fraction bound over unbound, um, the log of that is exactly zero. And if you look at the slope of this, uh, from this expression, we know that it's going to be between zero and two, where two is your theoretical limit because you have two subunits maximum. And for that reason, uh, we can determine whether you have cooperativity, whether it's positive or if it's negative. So in the case of no allosteria at all, there'd be no cooperativity. So your KD2 over KD1, both of those KD values would just be the same. And this would evaluate to two uh, in the denominator and this entire thing would evaluate to one. So NH equals one indicates no cooperativity. And if NH is greater than one and NH less than one, well, an NH of less than one would occur if your KD2 is greater. And as we discussed, this corresponds to a situation of negative cooperativity, which means that this corresponds to positive cooperativity. Okay, uh, so quite a bit was discussed there. Um, but if you have any questions- Can you repeat uh, what you just said? Sure. So uh, I was talking about the Hill coefficient right here. And whenever you have a Hill coefficient equal to one, that indicates that you have no cooperativity, so no allosteria whatsoever. Whereas if you have a Hill coefficient greater than one, that indicates positive cooperativity. A Hill coefficient of less than one indicates negative cooperativity. Thank you. Um, okay. One, one more question. Um, yeah. So like those two curves that you overlaid each other for um, the graph on the right, is it useful to think of KD1 as like the first event where just since it's tense, it's, I guess, harder to reach the saturated point, right? So it just takes longer to reach where it's totally saturated. And then KD2 curves like event two. After right. the first so, one, I think it's down. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. But um, just one note that I would make on that is that um, the reason why this is KD1 and not KD2 is because this is a situation in which we have a positive cooperativity protein. So if you had a case of negative cooperativity, then your, um, your binding affinity gets worse over time. So you'd be transitioning from relaxed to tense. Um, the reason why we're transitioning from tense to relaxed is because it's positive cooperativity. Right. But in general, is KD1 like the allosteric binding and then KD2 is the binding of like the pri at the primary site, I guess? Yeah. Um, typically, when the problem set will talk about allosteria, you have like a multi subunit protein. So, to kind of go back to this diagram, um, the, the event really in which allosteria will kick in is if you have one ligand already bound to the protein, because this ligand bind, because we're saying that this protein is allosteric, then that means the KD, the binding affinity for the second for the second ligand will be different from the affinity with the first ligand. So if there's no allosteric, then the binding affinity for the first one is going to be no different from the second one. Um, if it's positive cooperativity, then after the first ligand is bound, it should be sort of easier to get the second one on. And if it's negative cooperativity after the first one's bound, it should be harder to get the second one on. Okay, so I think we should get into solving question four and we can discuss this further in 4D when I'll go over that. Okay, so I'll be going over question four. Let me just share my screen.
Okay, so um, question. So question 4A, um, it asks us about the advantage of scatter analysis. Does anyone have any um, thought or guess? Is it because um, you only need to know the uh, concentration of the ligand that you add? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and any other? Guesses? Um, I know that the X intercepts gives us the total protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can see from this equation here too. So um, um, as long so this is the slope, and this is the y intercept. And Pujan just derived this equation, so I'm not gonna rederive it. So as long as we have the concentration of bound ligand and also the ratio of the bound ligand and the total ligand, we can find the KD value here and we can, we can also use the KD value that we found to find the total protein concentration. Wait, so, so last time, uh, I thought it was the X intercept or, oh, it actually should be the Y intercept, right? I think last time somebody said X intercept. Oh. Uh, yeah, it should yeah, be, because, mm -hmm. yeah, it's Y-intercept. So the advantage of using scatter analysis, as um, you guys said, is to, um, it allows us to find the KD value. without actually knowing how much um, the protein is actually present in the sample. And the protein here is, um, is the receptor that's stated in the question. So this also means that we don't need to do any purification of the protein. Is there any questions about part A? Okay, so then for part B, we are asked to find the um, KD value and also the concentration of receptors using the scatter equation right here. And so the KD value here, we can use the slope to find it. Just take the inverse of the slope. And then the concentration of receptor here is the um, total protein concentration. So after we find the KD value, we can um, find the total um, protein concentration. So, um, and we can just use the general equation for slope by um, finding any two points on the graph. So I picked this two, I picked these two points, but you guys can pick any other two points. And the general equation for slope is just delta y over delta x. So here will be one over three divided by this. And that will give us a value for um, slope. And we also know that slope equals to negative one over kd. So then we can find KD by one negative one over slope. And we can plug the value there. Plug the slope value in to find um, what the KD is. And then we know from this equation here that P, um, 
the y intercept. Oh, actually. Um, so to find to in order to find the y intercept, we can just simply set the x value equal to zero. And so here this is the x value and this is the y value. So we know that um when x is zero, y is a uh, five. So we can simply set um this term equal to five. And we also know the kd value from before. So that will allow us to find the protein concentration. Does anyone have any questions about part B? Okay, so then for part C. So part C and part D, um, the general context is to help us um, distinguish between allosteric interaction and non-allosteric interaction. And then, so for non-allosteric interaction, as Pujan just showed, um, the, um, it does, the, the, graph would just be a simple straight line as shown here. And here's the equation that Pujan just derived. So in part one, we are asked to find the dissociation constant Kb. And so from in this equation, here's the uh, y value and here's the x value. And if we set, so we know that when y equals zero, um, log of ligand concentration will be equal to log of kd. So this will allow us to find log of kd, and we can um, just convert it to convert it to find the kd value. So we can simply draw on the graph to find where Y, when, y inter, when y is zero and find the corresponding x value. So this is around negative three. And then we know that log um, 10 to the log of kd will give us kd value. So you guys can, oh, Sorry. And then you can just um, find the KD value from there. And for part two, we are asked to find the concentration range of ligand over which protein switches from 10% um, bound to 90% bound. So here, um, so when the protein is 10% bound, that means our fraction bound is 10%, which means fraction of unbound is 90%. So if we plug these two numbers, if we plug these two numbers into this equation right here, we'll be able to find the y value for the on the curve on the graph. So 
So this will give us some um, value. And then for 90% bound, the fraction bound will be 90%, and fraction of unbound will be 10%. So these two numbers here will give us the y values on the graph. And then we can just go on the graph and find their corresponding x values. So it would be, um, I didn't calculate the numbers, but it will be, uh, let me change. It will be something like this. And then that's for the um, 10%. And then for 90% bound, it will be something like this. And then you can just find where it intercepts with this curve. So this will be the corresponding um, ligand concentrations. And then we want to find the um, concentration range. So we just need to see how much they change from um, this value to this value. And in the end, um, after you do all these calculations, you should find the um, concentration of ligand increased by about 100 fold. Um, is there any questions about this part? If not, we can go on to part D. And I think Pujan is gonna take over. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. so. Does, does everyone see my sheet of paper? Uh, not yet. Though. Okay, now it's good. All right. Okay, so this is quite it's a question that we'll talk a little bit about Alistair. So here I have some x, y values just extracted from this graph here for reference. Um, they'll be useful later. So First, the first thing that we want that they're asking for is determining the values of the dissociation constants of the T and R states, and we want to know how we work out our answer. So as we talked about previously in Alistair, what you have, if you refer back to our notes, is the binding isotherm that we're given is this line. And what we want to find out are the KD1 and KD2 corresponding to the linear part here and the linear part here. So if we look at this graph, we can kind of see like this binding isotherm roughly looks like this. And so we know that the, these three points, if you extrapolate them, should give you the uh, binding affinity of the relaxed state. And these points down here, if you extrapolate them, should give you the binding affinity of the tense state. So one important line in this graph is the one corresponding to a log of f over one minus f of zero. And if you extrapolate the intersections, This is roughly corresponding to your KD1 and KD2. Uh, now, of course, we can actually fi find the equations of the line and actually get these KD values. So that's kind of the rough intuition of what we're trying to go for. So uh, first, we can start with the relaxed, uh, with the tense state down here. And if we, if we were to consider just these two points, um, we can kind of see from this trend right here that you have uh, the X and Y values are negative nine, negative nine, and negative eight, and negative eight. Um, and the focus on my screen is, Okay, so we can kind of see that this trend is eventually gonna get you to the point of zero, zero, which means that when log of F over one minus F is zero, you have your log of ligand concentration also equal to zero. Uh, 
And so in order for a log of L to be zero, you need to have L being one. So for the, uh, for the 10 state, so that gives you a value of one molar. And you can similarly apply that analysis for KD1. And looking at this, these two points, you can find the equation on the line and you can uh, trace it back to KD2. Uh, specifically, what you want to do is, in fact, you can actually just use one point because we know that log of F of one minus F is just going to give you log of L minus log of KD. And if you consider this point up here, the log of L is two and log of uh, F over one minus F is five. So you just have five equal to two minus log of KD. And then if you solve that equation, that would, will give you KD2, which corresponds to the relaxed state. So for part two, does this protein exhibit positive cooperativity or negative cooperativity? So as we pointed out earlier, if you look at the relationships between cooperativities um, based on the KDs, if your KD1 is greater than your KD2, then you have a situation of positive cooperativity Whereas if it's the other way around, then you have a situation of negative cooperativity. So based on the answer that you get for part one, you should be able to answer part two. And then if you want to explain it using um, a more intuitive explanation, you can say that uh, after the first molecule binds, the KD um, changes in such a way such that uh, the binding affinity is either greater or lesser corresponding to positive or negative cooperativity, but you can use the numbers to justify it as well. Okay, so for uh, part three. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, what, what, what does that say exactly? Log F1 minus F is equal to log, I can't really read that. Oh, that's a log L minus log KD. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm kind of confused about part I in general. Like, I thought that at zero, you have KD1 and KD2 for log F over one minus F. So where did you get the two and five from? Oh, so uh, what, um, I'm basically using what I call point L, which corresponds to this point right here. Um, and this equation, uh, log F of one minus F equal to log L minus log KD, that's true in general. So um, I just plug that in um, for this point here. So if you want to save yourself the work of like making the line and then extrapolating it all the way to this point, you can just plug in this value here and say, okay, well, if I know log of F over one minus F and I know log L at that point, then I can determine log KD. Wait, why didn't you do that with uh, the tense state? So this is for the relaxed state? Right, uh, so yeah, that was for the relaxed state. And for the tense state, what I did was I observed that if you look at the trend of your log L and your log of F, um, one minus F, uh, at this point, it's negative nine and nine. At this point, it's negative eight and eight. And at this point, it's negative seven and negative seven. So it will eventually reach the point where it's zero and zero. Uh, so if your log of L, so essentially if your log of L term is zero and this term is zero, you have log of KD equals zero, which means that your KD is a uh, one. Wait, could you, uh, could you also use the method that you just, that you just, uh, said for the relaxed state? It would give you the uh, same answer? Uh, you could, yeah. Um, but there are only like two, I think, really good points here. And so I found it more convenient just to uh, plug in these two values. In fact, what you could also do is take this point negative nine, negative nine, and then apply this method and that would also work. Okay. Yeah, all right. Um, so moving on to part three. So this is similar to what we did in 4C. Uh, so someone's asking about the bottom. Um, so are you referring to part one? Okay, uh, so this right here says log of one equals uh, zero. So KD one is equal to one molar. This says log of F over one minus F is equal to log of L minus log of KD. And I plugged in essentially these values here to get five is equal to two minus log KD. And for part three, we want to uh, see the concentrations at 10% uh, bound and 90% bound. So um, as we did in our previous analysis, This is what corresponds to a log of F minus one over F, uh, where you have 0 0.1 over 0 0.9. That's approximately negative one. And for log of 
0.9 over 0.1, that's approximately one. So if we look at our graph, uh, we're looking for the x and y, the, the y coordinates where you have one and negative one. And so you can find these points yourself, um, but I found roughly that this corresponds to this point over here, uh, which is, has negative two. So this is negative two. And then this point over here has a value of negative one. So you went from a log of L of negative two to negative one. And because that's a log scale, that's a factor of 10. So in the previous part, we found that it's a factor of 100. And in this case, it's a factor of 10. So you can comment what, how um, the switch happens from 10% to 90% bound in a change of 10-fold versus 100-fold in the previous part. And finally, you are asked to estimate the Hill coefficient in this case. So as we pointed out previously, the Hill coefficient, you can get the value of the Hill coefficient by finding the slope of the line when the log of f over 1 minus f is equal to 0, which corresponds to uh, this point here. So I'll do this in red so that it makes it easier. So what you're interested in finding here is this slope. OK, and that's kind of hard to see. But basically, you want this point and this point. So OK, I, I don't know if people can really see that that well. But if you find the slope of the line between this point and this point, that should give you the value of the Hill coefficient that you're looking for. And then based on that, you know that the value of the Hill coefficient that you find is going to be a lower bound for the number of subunits that you have, which should be your way of uh, answering this part of the question. Um, anyone have any questions? I know that was a little fast. Can you go Sorry, over can to you... again? Oh. What was that? Can you go over the second part again? Sure. Uh, okay. First, let me see if I can it's possible for me to zoom in. Uh, okay. So, so like part two? Yeah. Okay. So basically your analysis of uh, this being either positive or negative cooperativity depends on your values for KD1 and KD2. So if you find that your KD1 is greater than KD2, then that's positive cooperativity. Um, whereas if you find that your KD1 is less than KD2, um, then, then that's negative cooperativity. Thanks. Any other questions? Sorry, do you mind explaining question part three again? Part three? Yes. Yeah. So uh, at part three, we're asked to basically determine the ligand concentration over which we go from 10% bound to 90% bound. And so if you look at the ligand concentration at which you're 10% bound, that corresponds to a log of f over 1 minus f of approximately negative 1, because the log of 0 0.1 over 0 0.9 is about negative 1. And if you trace that point, uh, it, it's right here. Whereas, and then the x value at this point is negative 2. And then if you trace the value for log of 0 0.9 over 0 0.1, which is 90% bound, then that traces to this point over here. And here, the value of log is uh, negative 1. So you went from a ligand concentration of uh, negative two, which corresponds to like 10 to the negative two molar to a concentration of 10 to the negative one molar. So your protein goes from 10% bound to 90% bound over a concentration of 10 to the negative two to 10 to the minus one. Um, that's a factor of 10. Whereas in the previous part, when you had no allosteria at all, you went from 10% bound to 90% bound over a 100 fold change. So it was something like, um, so it would be something like 10 to the negative 3 to 10 to the 0. So the starting and endpoint values are not important, but just the magnitude over which the shift occurs. Uh, one more question. Could you go over about as to why you chose 2 and 5? Just like what led you to let, like, choose those two points in particular? Yeah, so you could use this last point over here, or you could use this point right here. The important thing is you want to choose points that are still in the linear range so if you look at this graph, at some point it's linear because most of the protein is in like the tense state, or it's linear in this range because most of the protein is in the relaxed state. But right around here is where the shift occurs. 
And this is kind of, um, this is slightly subjective, but to me, it looks like these first three points are pretty linear with the relaxed state. So just to be safe, I chose this point and that has coordinates uh, two and five. And so that's why you can use that point. Um, you can also use uh, this point right here. You should get the same answer. And um, so it says tense. Um, how'd you conclude that was one molar exactly for KD1 does? Yeah, so um, I guess if we can uh, look at the equation again. And then if we plug in here, this point was negative nine and negative nine. That corresponds to this point all the way at the bottom here. Then you have negative nine is equal to negative nine minus log KD. Um, and then you're gonna just get left with log KD equals zero, right? And then if you raise everything um, to the power of 10, you'll get KD equal to one. Okay, yeah, so um, so after you get KD is equal to one, then you draw that horizontal line at the one part for log S over one minus S, and then that should give you, I guess, information about those two points of where log L lies. Um, could, you, could you repeat the question? Like the horizontal, where did I draw the horizontal line for what? Uh, I, I'm assuming one right there, that thick black line of where you got one more. Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, um, the reason why I drew this line was because this is where log of f over 1 minus f is 0. Um, okay. And that's significant because, one, you could kind of like, if you pretend that this was like we discussed um, kind of in the introduction to the problem, where this value of 0 is important because then you could extrapolate to it. Um, it's also important because that's where the slope of the line for Hill coefficient calculation comes in. So it's just kind of like an important reference point in the graph. However, in this case, we were able to compute the value uh, of KD1 and KD2 without extrapolating the line all the way, um, just by plugging in the points into the equation. And then one more question, why is one molar relevant at all? Like, why do we have to determine if KD is one molar? Because, um, I mean, I could just see that you just took points from the line after drawing it without really referring to the one molar, I think, on the five equals two part. Yeah, um, so because uh, we're supposed to estimate the values of the dissociation constants, so you need a KD for your tense state and a KD for your relaxed state. So okay. that's why. Oh, so it's just for later then is why I found it. Uh, well, I, I think like this question specifically asked you for like the dissociation constant. So I think they want to oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay, any other questions? All right, so uh, we are over time. So uh, Byron, do you think you can run over five really quickly or just run take over two minutes? Maybe I'll run over real fast and then people can ask me some questions and I can probably answer them. Yeah. Share the screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, so um, this question is again about equilibrium and we won't have time to go over everything, but um, I want to point out um, because I, uh, when I was listening uh, to uh, um, the explanation about the second question, people have some, um, uh, uh, people are confused about uh, what's the difference between equilibrium uh, constant and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, reaction quotient Q. So um, if you go over the derivation of the equilibrium constant, you would see that we have to have a, um, we have to look at these, this, this graph here. And uh, when it is equilibrium, 
this DG over the reaction progress um, xi is um, zero. So we are using this assumption to come up with this, uh, this uh, equilibrium constant KEQ equals to um, the, uh, the concentration of the product over concentration of the uh, reactant. However, um, KEQ is a very special value. It only tells you things uh, that's dg over dz equals to zero. So for all the other parts of this curve, you would actually uh, be describing Q. So um, let me um, show you um, which part would make the difference. Wait a second, because we're not going over this, so I have to find it. Okay, it's right here. So, uh, after a lot of math, we would come to this equation, and um, we arbitrarily define here this term as the equilibrium constant. So, in order to um, have this equation going, um, we have to assume that this, that the whole equation, when we have these standard terms on the other side, is equal to zero. So if it is not zero, uh, if it is not at equilibrium, then we have to um, then we have to consider that um, we have a Q, which looks very similar to this. Um, let me use the permanent ink. And if you're considering a reaction that has a reactant and then a product, it would be a product of a reactant. But now these uh, concentration is going to be different. It's going to be different from these two concentrations. They're not the equilibrium concentration, but the, concent the actual concentration at a different time before you reach equilibrium. So the terms looks really similar. And somebody asked uh, whether they are the same or what's the similarity. So I'll, uh, for that, I can tell you that KEQ is a special value of Q. So Q is a larger concept and KEQ is a, a, a special uh, uh, case of Q. So if we go to this question uh, number five, after you run your uh, uh, script, this is what you get. So you would have um, a KQ equals, equals to one, KQ equals to five, and then 10. So in this particular question, we're using a slightly different uh, uh, view uh, to look at this KQ. Instead of using concentration, just like what I uh, described above, we use probability to write uh, out this equilibrium constant. So, um, we have two different states in each of these graphs here. So we have the zero state and the state one. So you got two different probabilities of finding uh, molecules in these two states. So if we define M as the um, total number of molecules you have, and then molecules in state zero, uh, as N0, and molecules in state one as N1, then we can write down these uh, probability uh, expressions for this, these two states. And this M, if you remember when we uh, uh, talk about multiplicity, we use M uh, to, to define some arbitrary grid box. And that box, can also have a volume. So these uh, M can be thought as equal to a uh, 
alpha times v, where this alpha is the uh, proportionality constant. It relates uh, the volume and uh, and and a uh, very arbitrary um, number of grid box. So in this case, m is not the grid box, but the uh, total number of molecule. But it is still a um, very similar concept. So now we write down these two probabilities. And then we describe the KEQ equals to, in this case, not PA1 and PA2, but uh, KEQ would be equal to P1 over P2. So if you look at these three different graphs, when you look at state one for KEQ equals to one, and then state zero for K, uh, KEQ equals to one, you will find that the molecule uh, uh, goes evenly between these two uh, states. But if you increase the KEQ, which means this P1 gets a little bit larger, you would see a larger um, um, amount of uh, molecules reside in state one instead of state zero. And if you go, a, go to an even higher KEQ, these small um, jumping back and forth back to the uh, uh, zero state is even less than what you had up there. So uh, does anybody have any questions uh, for part A to part uh, C or D, I think? Part A to part D, please feel free to ask. So for um, part C, it is um, a algebra question. You just need to derive uh, from the definition, KEQ equals to P1 over P0. I'm sorry for the uh, typo here. Um, you can derive what P0 is. And I want to give you a hint. So P0 is equal to 1 minus P1. Because P0 plus P1 has to equal to 100%. Okay, um, and then part D is more about understanding what KEQ kind of tells you about the distribution of um, of these molecules. So you can think about a bell curve. Of course, uh, we don't have a normal distribution here, but what uh, standard deviation tells you is from the center how far away you're going to go, and then how much molecule are under this curve, how many molecules are under this curve. So, so part D is um, you, uh, the question asks you to calculate uh, the standard deviation under different KEQs to give you a um, quantitative understanding about uh, the distribution result from different KEQ values. So part E, after you run your script, this is what you get. And the difference between this graph and the previous three graphs is the time. So now we allowed a longer time and then we squeezed them into the same scale. So what you can see here, because it is KEQ equals to one. So According to the definition here, we write for KEQ, P1 should approximately equal to P0. So what you see on the graph is that the molecule just jump back and forth equally. Okay. So does anybody have any question about this question, uh, this particular problem? Um, is there a equation for standard deviation that's special for um, finding the number of molecules under the bell curve? I think the uh, uh, equation for the standard deviation was given in the question, right? Okay, it's already in the question. Okay, thanks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? 
So when you have a higher KQ, does that mean that more is bound? Uh, could you repeat the question again? So you, we have a higher KEQ, what, what is going down? Or is bound? Okay, so the question uh, told you, um, you can consider two different cases. And we're just talking about two states. So if you're uh, uh, defining state zero to be not bound, and then state one to be bound, then yes, if you go higher with KEQ, more molecule will be go, going into the bound state. But these definitions are quite arbitrary. They can rip, this zero and one can represent different states. So it depends on how you define it, okay? Is that um, un answering your question? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? or more uh, general question about equilibrium constant because we didn't go really uh, in detail of what I wrote out here. Could you like slowly scroll from the top to the bottom so we can read it later? Yes. So um, let me just, um, I think I should just go over it really fast. Um, if uh, if you stay, then we can just uh, have a look at this. Um, so basically, what I'm having here is a we consider this system of that has two regions, and it, we have two types of molecules. So um, we can write down the chemical potential for each. Uh, region and then we can define this delta mu a for molecule a and then delta mu b for mo molecule b which is the uh, difference of um, a difference between the chemical potential for these two sides for each of these molecules so after we write down this equation for a and then for b the concentration of A in region one can be written as NA1, number of molecule of A1 over V. And then same can be written for the region two. And then we do the same thing for B molecules in region one and region two. After that, we use this uh, M equals to alpha times V, which is the proportionality which is uh, the proportionality equation I, uh, I talked about. Uh, so basically these grid box, the number of these grid box are very arbitrary and we can, disc we can connect them together with this constant that we pick. So in this case, with all of these equations, we can do some math. And then what we get is delta mu A is equal to this equation kvt ln ca2 over ca1 so if you're uh, talking about these two different regions it's the concentration of one region over the concentration of the other and keep going so the chemical potential at any state is equal to the standard chemical potential i think i have to write minus RTL and C over C naught. Um, can another um, tutor help me confirm about this equation? Because I want to make sure it's correct. Is this a, a negative sign in front of R? I think it should be a plus sign. Plus, right? Yeah. Oh, my one note is crashing. Okay, let me go to my. Okay, sorry for the. Let me switch to another one note. My one note is crashing. Okay. 
Okay. So chemical potential at any uh, state is equal to the chemical potential of a um, of the um, standard state under the standard state condition plus R T L N C over C naught, where C naught is one molar, and I have here a box uh, describing what are the standard state condition and the biological standard state condition. So the difference between the standard state and the biological standard state is that at biological standard state, we have pH equals to seven, which defines the concentration of uh, the proton. And then in both of these condition, we define a, uh, the concentration of H2O to be 55 M if uh, you're using water as your solvent. So now, after we did all these math, come up with these equations, we look at uh, these two different regions again, and then we can write down this equilibrium. And now let's just look at molecule A. Let's not worry about molecule B now. So molecule A can go to two, uh, the, uh, can go to region two, and then uh, molecule A can also travel back to region one in this uh, uh, system we described. And then we can write down this change of free energy is equal to the chemical potential of A1 in respect to the change of uh, the moles of A1 plus the chemical potential of A2 in respect to the change of A2. And then we describe, we want to uh, get rid of this term. So what we do here is we use the re reaction progress uh, plot where uh, DNA1, uh, NA2 on the top is going to be equal to the uh, uh, stoichiometric uh, coefficient before uh, A2 and A1, which is mu A2 and then mu A1. And both of them are equal to one. So we can cancel them. So now we replace this DA1 and DA2 with uh, D xi, which is the same term. And that's why when we have this uh, assumption when DG D xi is equal to zero, we can cancel uh, this term because this term D xi is not equal to zero. After we cancel that term, we come to the conclusion of under the assumption of equilibrium, we have to have mu A1 equal to mu A2. So the, pro, the, uh, so the uh, chemical potential of your reactant has to equal to the chemical potential of the product. So at equilibrium, we would denote the concentration of A1 and A2 as bracket uh, A1 EQ and bracket A2 EQ. We can also write down these two equations uh, as we explained right here, the uh, uh, chemical potential of A1 and A2 at any time. So then we use equation system two and equation one, we do some algebra, this is what we get. And next we re rearrange this equation, take this to the other side, take this term uh, to the uh, right side, and this is what we get here. And because this term is delta G naught, so we can replace this term, and then we define 
this concentration of product over concentration of your reactant to be your KEQ. And then if you have a given delta G naught, you can also find out the corresponding KEQ with uh, this, re, uh, this equation. So again, a remark on the unit of KEQ, because we are assuming uh, this um, standard uh, condition concentration of any molecule equals to one molar, we're basically being a little bit lazy here by not writing out this A2 naught and A1 naught. So this A2 and A, A, this A2 and A1 in this equation right here, they don't really have a unit because here we already canceled them out. So please remember, KEQ is unitless. Okay. Does anybody have any question on the math, uh, on any step of this derivation? Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, I'm going to end the session.